1966, the Black Panther movement was founded. Prominent among the founders were Bobby Seale, who is its president, and Huey Newton, after Eldridge Cleaver, probably its best-known champion. In recent months, of course, the Newton wing expelled Eldridge Cleaver, who is living in Algeria, so that the Seale-Newton wing is nowadays supreme. Meanwhile, the Black Panthers have turned their backs officially on violence as a means of accomplishing whatever it is they propose to accomplish, concerning which we will in due course be enlightened. Huey Newton, you will remember, was tried and convicted of killing a policeman, specifically of involuntary manslaughter. The slogan, Free Huey Newton, was to the late 60s what the slogan, Who Promoted Perez, was to the early 50s. The higher court reversed the verdict on a technicality, and Mr. Newton was tried twice more, the trial resulting in each case in a split jury. Finally, the presiding judge gave up, and Hugh Newton is free. His mother is from Louisiana, his father from Arkansas, and he is the youngest of seven children. He was schooled in Oakland, where he now lives. His first book was called To Die for the People, and imminently he will publish his autobiography, which is called Revolutionary Suicide, a concept I shall now ask Mr. Newton please to explain. Um, I'll explain it, uh, but if I may impose upon you, I have a friend who's uh, almost dying for me to ask this question, um, if you will. Um, the question is, uh, during the revolution of 1776, when uh, the United States of America broke away from England, uh, my friend would like to know, what side would you have been on during that time? <clears throat> I think probably I would have been on, uh, on uh, the side of George Washington. I'm not absolutely sure, because... Uh, it, it, it remains to be established historically whether what we sought to prove at that point might not have been proved by, by more peaceful means. On, on the whole, I'm against uh, revolutions. So I, not, think on, uh, I think yeah. as revolutions go, that was a pretty humane one. Yeah, you're not such a bad guy after all. My friend will be surprised to hear that. I hope oh, he's listening. His, his, his assumption was what? Uh, well... He was puzzled, but I think that uh, he was inclined to believe that you've been on the side uh, of the colonizers of England. But uh, I'm pleased with the answer, and well, uh, I agree with you. The only revolution that uh, is worth fighting is a humane revolution, and uh, also one that succeeds. Pardon me. Also one that succeeds. Yes, right. Because, eventually. Uh, I, I feel that if if uh, if King George had captured George Washington, he would have had the right to hang him according to the law yeah uh, but revolutions always in some ways contradict some laws that's why it's called revolution well re revolutionary justice is its own justice isn't it uh yes uh and of course it it always professes to go under some uh uh human uh, right or hum uh, humane uh, consideration and uh, i think that we can judge revolutions on the basis uh, of how much, in fact, or objectively, uh, people are given uh, uh, a fair, um, are dealt with in a fair way, and are given more freedom. Um, I, I, I think that one of my one of my principles is that uh, contradiction is the ruling principle of the universe, and everything uh, in uh, in phenomena, whether it's the physical world or the biological world or the uh, social world has its internal contradiction that gives motion to things, that internal strain. And uh, much of the time that uh, we homo sapiens um, uh, don't realize that no matter what sort of uh, conditions we establish, no matter what government we establish at this point, there also will be that uh, internal contradiction that will have to be resolved and it resolved in a rational, just way. And, uh, of course, that uh, leads us uh, uh, somewhat, um, uh, it's very vague on how to deal with it. 
and uh, many times we claim uh, actions are revolutionary uh, when really they're not. So uh, I, I would uh, I appreciate uh, your answer and uh, I would agree with that part of it. automatically if you have a tin can of marijuana with you. Right. But ever since I've been legal, I've always gone to the airport two hours early, even long before 9-11. Right. And now today, when I leave for Lauderdale, I always call the head of the police department at the airport, and we can advance. We give him my itinerary, tell him exactly what flight I'm on, and what time I'm going to security. They then send a letter out to the policeman in that area. And so if TSA does stop me and they call the police, and they go, we've got a gentleman here, Urban Rosenfeld, with a tin can of marijuana. The police will go, we know. He's legal. Thank you very much. Right. So I don't get bothered with people. That's good. And I, and I have his private cell phone number, so if I were to get bothered going through New Hampshire Airport, you know, I'd show him all the information. Plus, thank God, with, you know, with, with the Internet now, you just Google my name. Right. You can pull up thousands of articles on me and videos and everything else. So that usually suffices. But if it doesn't, then I have the private cell phone number, so captain of the police department of my hometown, and again, the head of the police department at Fort Lauderdale International, I have his private cell phone over there. So, because again, it's only four of us in the country that have the right to do this. Right. So you can't, you can't blame police or TSA or whatever for being alarmed about it. You, know, you can't get upset. You can't say, I'm legal, you know, leave me alone. You've got to explain that. Hey, it's an unusual circumstance, but it's, you know, it's the way it is. Smoke cigarettes as well? No. Nope. Have you noticed any, any pulmonary issues? Any? Uh, the last time my lung capacity was checked, uh, I was 108% of normal. Yes. Oh, okay. Marijuana does not cause lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Studies have been done by the top physicians in the country, and they did a 10-year study, and they couldn't find one case of lung cancer due to the counts. In fact, really, it's a neuroprotectant. The study also pointed out that people who smoke cigarettes and cannabis had less cancers than the people that just smoke cigarettes. Wow. And, and I grew up in Virginia. So I, I joke with people as a state law in Virginia that once you become 15, it used to be that you had to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a big tobacco state. Yeah, that's right. It's, I actually uh, have copies of that article, the, the study you're mentioning. I always leave them in the smoking lounge. Mm -hmm. Study finds no cancer marijuana connection. It's a Washington Post article. Dr. Donald right. Tashkin. Dr. Donald yep. Tashkin. Good guy. Great doctor. Okay. I mean, what I love about him, even though he was the main physician for 30 years to try to prove how bad cannabis is to the human body. His studies, he's honest. Meaning, here's his study, here's what he believes, he does his study and then reports the results. Right, wrong, and different, doesn't matter. Whatever the results are, that's what he reports. So I appreciate that, he's an honest position, and I like that. So as he said, he said, yeah, I really thought it caused lung cancer, I couldn't find one case of it. I was wrong, and he admitted it. So the sugar coating study. I have smoked forever, 
and I went to the doctor the other day. They clipped that little thing on my finger. My oxygen <coughs> saturation was 95%. My blood pressure is normal. My cholesterols are good. And my MS started in 1976. And the first thing that gave me any help with the fear was cannabis. Well, I don't recommend for anybody to smoke cigarettes. But yeah. I do tell people if they do smoke cigarettes, they should smoke cannabis. Yeah. Also. It's like you have to. And with college students here, I'll point out something else, okay? Which I, I speak to a lot of college students this well. And I'll take a look at uh, YouTube, okay? You are a procrastinator. A month ago, a month ago, a, a professor gave you a paper to write. Yep. It's due tomorrow, Monday, and it's Sunday at noon. And you went, oh, crap, I forgot all about that paper I got to write. You go and smoke a joint, maybe even two of them. Then you sit down, you write your paper, you make some corrections the next morning, and you hand it in. You have it exactly. You're in the same <laughs> class he's in. You're in the same class he's in. Okay, Absolutely. you're in the same class. It's Sunday at noon. You go, oh, God, I forgot all about that paper. You go to smoke a joint, and then you go, oh, man, screw it. I don't feel like writing that paper. You're giving me a bad name. Meaning cannabis harms you. It makes you a vegetable. It makes you where you don't want to do anything. You're lethargic. Nothing wrong with that. Just don't ever do it unless you can afford to be lethargic. Right, exactly. Be somewhere where you don't, it doesn't matter. Okay, but if you've got work to do, it messes you up. You, it enhances your thought process. It doesn't harm you at all. So fine, God bless you. You do it. But you've got to know what cannabis does to you. Okay, and if it harms you in any way, then don't, don't put yourself in harm's way. Because if you do and something happens, then what I'm trying to do out here gives me a bad name. I've got to answer for you. I don't like that. Yeah, I just wish I could go to a store and buy, like, know what I'm buying. Because, mm -hmm. like, certain varieties tend to help me do schoolwork and put in that state of mind, right. others are immediate couch potatoes. So yes, it's really sativa nice and indica, it makes a difference. Yep. Yeah, it'd be really nice yep. to have that. Mm -hmm. It would be, and one day hopefully that will happen. But yeah. until then, <laughs> until then, you know, just know that cannabis is just cannabis. Yeah. And if anything, any way any cannabis harms you, then never put yourself in that position. You know, the, the bill originally in New Hampshire originally um, covered post-traumatic stress syndrome, and that was stripped out of it. That was a big disappointment, I think, for a lot of people, because we were hoping that we could become part of the groundbreaking um, research and development that's going on. Um, mm -hmm. Now all they do is put you on, on clonopin and send you on your way, and, and we we're hoping that, that that could be part of it. So it was a disappointment that that got stripped out. Well, again, I would you know state to your representatives, the Veterans Administration, who better to say whether it's a medicine or not for your veteran? And they say it is. Yep. So why do you know more than the Veterans Administration? You know, you ask them that. Yep. Of course, I always ask them, why do, you know more, why do you think you know more than the American Medical Association or the American Nurses Association when they sanction it? So yeah, PTS is definitely a disorder. And it works. Israel's studying it. Israel's using it for that reason. And I think all you know, other countries are looking into it. Yep. And this country should. You know, and they are. You know, the states, other states, it's allowed. <coughs> but again, that, yes, and again, veterans are going to do it anyway. Once they learn, they're going to do it anyway, they, whether you have a law saying they can do it or not. Yeah. Are they going to worry about breaking a law? They fought a war. They killed people. Are they going to worry about some kind of words on a paper saying that they're a criminal? So if that's a needed medicine, they should be able to use it. The, now, the pharmaceutical industry, do you think that some of their opposition to this is because they want the market, they want to get... They want to bring it into pill form and make the money well, that de way? Well, definitely that's the case. I mean, they, they want it only substantiated by FDA. And they make it sound like that before there was FDA, there was never a medicine in this country. You know, until FDA sanctioned it. So the pharmaceutical industry does not want to see anything that can be, that you can do without using them. And the problem with this is you can go home and grow your own. And that's one of the major problems that the pharmaceutical industry has. With it's true. You can empower yourself through your own treatment rather than exactly. going to them. Exactly. And so that's one of the major problems that the, that the pharmaceutical industry has with this. Mostly from our favorite chief of police, but you know, from various other people is, you know, they can't have a medical marijuana law because then there'll be medical marijuana in the parents' houses and the kids will get a hold of it. And you say, well, but without it, they can get a hold of their parents' morphine tablets or Oxycontin tablets or whatever. So if they're going to get in their parents' medicine cabinet, would you rather them get a hold of the marijuana or would you rather them get a hold of the Oxy? But that's still and an they argument. They never have an answer to that. Right. But. Yeah, it's still, 
I'm not in favor of anybody in that formative year is using any illegal substance. I don't think they should. But if a qualified physician believes that a underage person needs this medicine, then that's, that's their job. Sure. Well, I mean, the way I look at it is they don't, they don't say you harmed more or are you helped more. Right? And they don't say to a two and a half year old, well, you know, you've got cancer, and I'd like to use chemotherapy, but you're too young. Okay. They don't do that. They go, no, you're going to go through chemotherapy. Well, then why do you say that they're too young to use a medicine that might take the nausea away from them, but yet they're not too young to go through chemotherapy, or to be prescribed? I mean, right, right. Adderall, Ritalin, you know, all that. Oh, yeah. That's, 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 that's Ritalin, they hand out all the candy. It's yeah, cool, exactly. you know? Yeah, yeah. So much it's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, my, my little uh, nephew, creative kid, just all over the place. Get, that, get him on Ritalin, mm -hmm. you know, so he can kind of just shut up and get in line at school, you know? Well, there's been, there's been many cases of kids, you know, with autism and things like that that have come around on cannabis where they haven't known anything else. Yeah. And one in particular, a, a kid named Joey. 10 year old kid that again very artistic and he basically uh, couldn't go to any schools he was killing himself knocking his head against the wall things like that stopped eating he lost half his body weight and the doctors just told his mother just take him home and he die and his mother put him on cannabis well what happens when you start using cannabis you get the munchies most people do so he started eating so he put his body weight back on another thing that happens with cannabis is you aren't mean anymore, you aren't mad. So he stopped hitting his head against the wall. Okay. And then this kid, 10 years old, had never spoken a word in his life. Well, when you get high, what else happens to you? You start chatting, you start talking. And he started talking for the first time. All because of cannabis. And he had, she had to go to court because they were trying to take the kid away from her because she, she was taking, giving him cannabis. Wow. And she won that court battle, luckily. So, you know, people just, they believe the hysteria that's been taught to them all their lives. And I don't blame them. I thought it was, I thought it was dangerous too. I was so different. Until I started using it. And I realized this is not dangerous. It's benign. Irv, I notice you're smoking as opposed to having like a capsule of cannabis that you're consuming. Uh, right. A lot of the police chiefs uh, that are dissenting with the current legislation are saying, oh, well, if it's not a pill, it's clearly not medicine. Can you explain why it is that smoking it would be more beneficial than consuming it for some people? Right. When you smoke cannabis, you titrate it. You get the effects of it almost immediately. So if you've got a medical problem and you're taking it for that reason, then once that medical problem clears up, you stop taking it. You don't need it anymore. You put it out. Where a pill, you can't titrate as well, meaning it goes to your system, it goes through your liver, it takes 40, 45 minutes for it to react. And then some people think, what's well, not working, let me take another. And then all of a sudden, both of them hit you, and you overdose. You take too much. And you go to sleep, is what happens. So smoking really is the best form or vaporization. I don't have a vaporizer with me, so I don't vaporize when I'm traveling, especially. So smoking is the easiest way, and it's the best way to get into your system. And again, it does no harm to the lungs at all. People won't believe that it does, because you're smoking. Well, you're smoking cigarettes, it might do harm to the lungs. But smoking cannabis clears your lungs up. So, um, smoking is the best way of delivering. Wait, wait, wait. Senator. Interesting. Um, with, you know, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I didn't. It was like I diagnosed on a Thursday, into surgery and so forth. And the following Tuesday, I didn't have time to to get involved or anything like that. But I had to um, I had to sneak out behind my house because everyone was against marijuana. I had to sneak out behind my garage before uh, before my. Um, uh, radiation treatment in, in uh, smoking, right. and, I, and I hadn't realized that. Like, what am I? Why do I have to do this? Look at me, I have cancer. Um, I, I'm, I'm my mar marijuana is working better than my $1,600 prescription for Zofran, right. and I'm hiding behind my garage so my mother in law doesn't see me exactly. smoking. It was ridiculous, you know, and that's kind of what propelled me into the into activism, you know. It's so, uh, yeah, just well, when, once facing a, a life threatening. Uh, disability or life-threatening disorder. It brings one to the realization that, hey, this is just a plant. It's all it is, okay? And I gotta go through cancer. It's like, and you wanna make me a criminal because I'm using this? So that's what people have to realize. And also people have to realize that diseases, you know something? They don't know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. They have no idea. So it hits everybody. It's all families. That's what really makes me realize that, you know, people should understand that Everybody should be in favor of this, okay? It should be controlled, nothing wrong with that. But take your situation, okay? The way this law is written, it wouldn't help you. 
from what I've read about this law? Meaning you were diagnosed on a Thursday and Wednesday you were in? Uh, yeah, the following Tuesday. Okay, following the, Tuesday. The okay. Knife, yeah. Gee, you have four days to grow plants? Yeah. Okay, that's why, <laughs> you know, that's yeah. why you need, you need a way to be able to go and say, God, I just got diagnosed with this. They're telling me I've got to go through radiation in four days. You know, and they're telling me, my doctor's telling me if I get the cannabis, it might take away the nausea and you can go to buy some, you know, or with a doctor's recommendation. Because you don't have time to grow. I've never grown a plant in my life. I wouldn't have to grow it. I mean, the federal government grows it. Okay, so I don't have to grow it. And the feds wouldn't allow me to grow it, first of all. I'd be breaking the law, just like everybody else would. Hey, hey, Herb, I want to introduce you to Gary Lambert. He's a senator. He's on Health and Human Service Committee, uh, a Marine. And he was opposed, and then he supported it this year. Yeah, Gary, so turn it around on committee. Very good. Nice to meet Thank, you. Nice to meet you. Thank yeah. you. And one of the important aspects I was telling him is with the Veterans Administration. Okay, my organization, Patients Out of Time, we're the only organization in the United States that's sanctioned by the American Medical Association and the American Nurses Association to teach doctors and nurses about medical cannabis to where they get continuing education credit to come to our conference or download our previous conference. We do it every two years, which was in Rhode Island two years ago. They get continuing education. We've also got the Veterans Administration to come out and take it. Now, what the Veterans Administration states is this, which is very important, is if a veteran is taking OxyContin, any kind of opiates, and they go to a VA center, and they take a blood test or urinalysis, and they test positive for metabolites of cannabis, the VA has instructed their doctors to withdraw treatment of that veteran, take away the opiates, withdraw, withdraw it. Unless you're in a state that allows it. If you're in a state that allows it, <coughs> you're fine. No problem. Just because you have cannabis in your system, we still, we still, we'll, still, we'll still treat you. So what I'm saying is it's, it's, it's not right. Where a veteran in Florida where I live or in Virginia where I grew up, and same here with New Hampshire, isn't afforded the same rights as veterans in 17 other states, a third of this country. So what I like to say to politicians is, you know, we talk about medical cannabis as a medicine, this, that, and the other, and I've argued this for 40 years, okay, 30 years legally. But now I'm going to argue this. Senator, let me ask you a question. Why are you against our veterans? And if, you, if, if there's no law in the yeah. state, then you are literally against veterans because they're not afforded the same treatment as other states. So that right there to me is a compelling argument that politicians are, should be in favor of veterans, should say, what can I do to help? Okay, if this is what you want, if this is what the VA says we need to do, then we need to do it. Because what's right for our veterans is what's right for our state. Yeah, I'm the chairman of the Veterans Affairs right. Committee, also a retired Marine. Mm -hmm. uh, can you send me a copy of where the VA is on board? I mean, I support the medical marijuana. I voted okay. against it before, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But then I came back and I voted against the veto and supported it this year. Mm -hmm. But I have some issues with it, even though I'm mm -hmm. supporting it. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, the, when you're driving under the influence, mm -hmm. okay, any test, uh, how, how do we handle that? Well, my federal protocol says that I'm allowed to operate dangerous machinery as long as I'm not intoxicated. Now, I get no high on cannabis. I never have. It's very unusual. Okay, it's not the norm. Okay. So when I'm stopped by a police officer and they tell me I can't drive with this and I show them the protocol, I go, am I intoxicated? They go, no. So again, your police officers are trained to be able to tell if somebody's intoxicated or not. A blood test doesn't work. If it shows metabolites in your system, that's because cannabis can stay in your system for over 30 days, if not longer. Because see, we, ha we have natural cannabinoid receptors all throughout our body. We manufacture natural cannabis. The THC content you're talking about. Well, the THC that stays, stays in your system, it's almost like I try to explain, people like to compare alcohol with, with cannabis. Now, let's say it's exactly the same, exactly the same substance, basically. Okay, today is Tuesday, okay? Saturday a week ago, I had three drinks. Today, if they test me, and alcohol's the same as cannabis, I'm drunk, because it's in my system. But I had a drink eight days ago, so you know I'm not drunk, but my blood work says I'm drunk. That's the problem with cannabis. You could have smoked cannabis nine days ago, but your blood work's going to show you're high. So you, what you need to do is train who's in charge, such as your police officers, is to be able to tell, which is what they do on prescription drugs and other, other medicines, whether they're intoxicated or not. Well, we have here in New Hampshire the laws of the books that cover um, drugs, or, you know, if you're driving in the influence or uh, driving in danger across the yellow line. So we have sure. laws. Yeah. That's, that's, that's it's the same thing. Right. They're it's behavior just, based. Right. It's just like it's so just like any prescription. Any you're just like any prescription. Drive well impaired on any substance, yes. whether it's oxycontin. So my question was on when I voted, I closed my eyes on that one because I'm saying, are we going to add to the court system now? You and, know, and, and, and you know, sir, something, sir. Let me just speak about uh, cannabis driving versus alcohol. 
And when you drive on alcohol, you're fine. Nothing's wrong. I can drive. I'm nothing wrong with me. I'm great. When you drive high, first of all, people don't plan to drive high. Very few people plan to drive high. People that normally don't get high or whatever go to a party and all of a sudden they get high, which is unusual, let's say. And now, oh God, I've got to drive. Well, they're thinking, I'm high, I've got to drive, and I don't want to, but I do. So you know how you can tell a lot of times whether somebody's driving high? Is they come up to a stop sign, and they stop, and they wait for it to turn green. Well, Meaning they're extra cautious. They're extra cautious because they know they're high. That's like, the difference. I would like to give you my card with my email. And I'd like to see the veteran sign. Uh, give it to Matt. It's, all, it's on our website. It's on our website. six years, and I've never seen anything come through my committee on veteran support. Well, that's why I'm letting you know. It's, right. it's through my organization, Patients at a Time, which the website's medicalcannabis.com. And see, the importance is my organization, like I'm not even a member of MPP. Okay, they brought me up here. My organization is Patients at a Time. We're completely medical. What they do is they do the lobby work. They do what they do. We do the medical. They don't have experts. We're the experts. So what do we, we, we try to work together. We don't lobby. My organization has no paid members. We have no, no membership per se, but we are the experts in the United States and the world for that matter. At our conference last week in Tucson, we had doctors from Germany, from South America, from England, from Portugal. All the top cannabinoid researchers all come to our conference and testify. That's well, what I'm we're going to run, but I got to tell you, we got to get three more senators. Well, get me in front of anybody. Around, get so. me in front of anybody you think you can. Yeah, I'll be here until 2:30. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Definitely. Thanks nice for coming out. You bet. But I definitely am looking for it because for future you use it. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's my guy. So I'm just getting on your luck. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I hate to break up this party. We got to get to a radio station right now. So I'm sure we'll be back in this room later today. <laughs> Let's hear from economist Jeffrey Tucker. He joins us live uh, here on RT International. Uh, Jeffrey, we're just hearing from Marina there. She met Charlie Shrem. She described him as a, a smart guy, of course, and is shocked by these allegations. You've met him yourself as well. How would you describe him? I think he's a brilliant young man. Um, he's he's, he's uh, shy, uh, uh, smart. He's been an incredible innovator in the Bitcoin space. And uh, she's right. He does know the law, and he does. Uh, he is uh, dedicated to compliance because he's he's dedicated to making this currency work. So I'm not entirely sure I understand what these allegations are are about. But we do have to remember that he was an early mover in the Bitcoin space. You know, even long before FinCEN came out with its uh, regulations about about uh, declaring every uh, exchange as a money exchange business. You know, thereby vastly increasing the compliance costs. I know that he was, you know, really serious about compliance himself, but he's he's been around a while. I mean, long before most anybody had ever heard about Bitcoin, Charlie Shrem was out there uh, persuading um, everyone to accept it and, and getting bars to accept it because he believes in it as, as a technology. And, and, will, and will his arrest, though, Jeffrey, undermine confidence now in a Bitcoin and, and uh, yeah. lead to its further devaluation? Because it's lost a lot of value, hasn't it? It's in trouble, isn't it? No, I mean, I, I heard you say that earlier in the show, and I quickly checked the price, and I'm not sure that I can detect much movement that's out of the ordinary at all. Well, it certainly it's reached dizzy heights, didn't it? It went an incredible value, and it's dropped from that, hasn't it? My name is Aaron. Are you buying them? You know, I, I I just saw Mount Gox's price at about 970, which is pretty much what I saw it at this morning. So I'm not entirely sure what you, what you mean by that. But it, but look, even if you see a 24-hour fluctuation or 48-hour fluctuation, on cryptocurrency is the future. It's just a much better technology than national monies. Yeah, you know, but, but, but it is linked, isn't it, to the criminal underworld? People are using it to buy illegal goods, and and that's why but, governments are targeting it, isn't it? But not nearly. It's not used to, to buy illegal goods nearly as much as dollars are, actually. 